common image in the teachings of the Forest of Johns is that the mind goes flowing out. In other words, greed, aversion, and delusion don't start from things outside. It's not the case that we're just sitting here perfectly fine and passive, placid. And then something comes along and stirs us up. All too often we're out there looking for trouble. The mind goes flowing out looking for things that it can desire, looking for things that it can get angry about. This is a tendency we have to learn how to keep in check. The Buddha himself has a similar image, he says. The streams, and here by he means the streams of the mind, are restrained by mindfulness and finally stopped by discernment. It's interesting that we're talking about mindfulness as a form of restraint. All too often we hear mindfulness being described as an open, accepting, spacious state of mind. But actually when you're establishing mindfulness, you're laying down some laws. You're establishing a territory. The mind is going to stay right here, and it's not going to wander out. As that image of the, the monkeys in, in the Himalayas. They wander away from their home. And because they wander away from their home, they get caught by the hunters. If they stayed in their home, the hunters couldn't get them. In the same way greed, aversion, delusion can get you when you get out of your boundaries of mindfulness. So at your boundaries right now, try to be very clear about them. You're going to stay with the breath. And you're going to work with the breath in a way that makes it comfortable. Because otherwise, if you find yourself hemmed in like this, the mind's going to rebel. It's going to want to go slip outside. It's like the image they have of catching a forest elephant. It gets tied to the post, so they have to give it nice food, give it nice music to listen to, to soothe its forest ways. Because it finally gets used to being tamed and actually likes being tamed. Same way with the mind. You've got to give it something good to stay with, which is why we work with the breath. Try to get the breath comfortable. Try to get it at ease. Ask yourself what kind of breathing would feel good. Now, sometimes energizing breathing feels good. And sometimes calming breathing feels good. So you can experiment to see what works for you right now. The Buddha talks about calming bodily fabrications is one of the important steps in breath meditation. But it's not all just about calming. There are times when you need to energize it as well. In fact, in some of these discussions of calming the mind or calming the body, first you have to get it energized with rapture. Rapture may be too strong a term, but it, in some cases, in some cases it, it's perfectly right. It, it's an overwhelming feeling of energy. But you've got to learn how not to get yourself overwhelmed. Other times it's more subtle, in which case the translation refreshment might be better. And then when the body has, and the mind have had a sense of it's enough, you can tune into a more refined level of pleasure, comfort. And let it spread around so the mind is happy to stay in these boundaries that you've established for it. Because once the mind has boundaries and their boundaries are clear, then you get to see when the mind goes flowing out, where does it go? Where is it coming from? This is necessary for understanding the mind, because otherwise we just go along with the flows and. This river flows into that river, and that river flows into this river, and the currents get all mixed together. We have no idea where things are coming from, where they're going. But when you establish a boundary like this, it's like damming the river. But you don't stop with just damming it. You have to divert it. In other words, take the energy of the emotion and have it flow into something that's actually skillful like the skillful practice of concentration, but also other skillful thoughts outside. Because as you keep the mind in control like this, you begin to get a better sense of what's going on, how the mind shapes a mental state, like we're trying to do right now. 
and you realize how much go work goes into it. You have to work with the breath. You have to work with what the Buddha calls direct thought and evaluation. In other words, thinking about the breath, making sure you stay on topic, and then asking yourself questions about it. What kind of breathing would feel good? Once it feels good, how do you spread that goodness around? How do you maintain that sense of goodness when you're spreading it? And then in the background there are the, the feelings and perceptions, the feeling of ease that comes when the breath feels good, and also the perceptions that hold you in place, perceptions of what the breath is doing in the body, where the breath stops, where it starts. All of this goes into creating this state of concentration. And as you get really good at, good at it, you find there are certain things you can let go of. When the breath is really good and it's been spreading through the body, you can let go of the direct thought and evaluation. Just be with the perception of breath. And there becomes a point where the, the breath stops. You know, you have this a sense of background energy filling the body that's not flowing in or out. And you begin to see that there are these elements that go into keeping the mind here. And it turns out they're the same elements that we use to create any mental state, especially with an emotion of the fear or lust or anger gets into your breath. It gets, goes from the mind into the body. That's all too often why we have a sense that, say, you have to get something out of our system. Because the way you've been thinking and the way you've been perceiving things will have an impact on the breath and that'll have an impact on the body. And that in terms has an impact back on the mind again. And so one of the skills you learn as a meditator is how to take these different ways of fabricating an experience and then refabricating and any unskillful emotion that comes up. For instance, if you're angry at somebody, you can ask yourself, one, how am I breathing right now? Hold in mind the perception that if you act on your anger, you're probably going to do something stupid, so you've got to get some control over it. So first you look at the breath to make sure that it's, it's normal and calm. And then you can see more clearly the inner chatter you have about the issue. And the Buddha says, well, give yourself some other ways of chatting about it. One is that just that thought, if you act on the anger, you're going to do something stupid. Do you want to do that? And how else can you look at this situation? What else can you focus on? If you're focusing on how horrible that person is, well, change the focus. As the Buddha said, look at for their good qualities. And he gives you a perception to help with that. Lots of different ways of perceiving it, actually. One of them is that the other person's goodness is like a little bit of water in a cow's footprint. You come along in the desert, you're hot, dry, tired, trembling with thirst. And you see the water. You realize if you scooped it up in your hand, you would muddy it. So you have to get down and slurp it up out of the footprint. Now, this is not a very dignified position to be in. You wouldn't want anybody to take a picture of you. But you realize you need it. In the same way, you need to think about that other person's goodness, because otherwise it's going to be very easy to mistreat that person. And you may feel that they are so bad that it's undignified, it's beneath you to focus on their goodness. Well, remind, you, remind yourself, you need that goodness. You need your goodwill. So you can trust yourself when you're acting with that person not to do anything that's going to be for your harm or for anybody else's harm. And so in this way you can take the anger and you can deconstruct it and construct something else in its place. Now this is still damning the stream, it's not getting to the source. Basically, you dam the stream, you're not going to go in the direction of anger, then you divert it off into something more skillful. But in the process, there still will be parts of the mind that don't want to go along. 
This is where the discernment comes in. The discernment has already helped in analyzing it in terms of fabrication. But as you keep diverting it and diverting it and diverting these unskillful thoughts, you get closer and closer to the source. And the source is the allure, why you go for these things. Because sometimes you hear we go for things because we think they have innate or some sort of essence. We don't realize that they're not permanent. There are a lot of things we go for we realize they're not permanent. In fact, some, one of the reasons we cling to a lot of things is because we know they're not going to last. So we try to squeeze as much out of them as we can while we can. We go for things for, because of the pleasure they offer, at least the pleasure we perceive. And a lot of times that pleasure, that the allure, is something we hide from ourselves. There's a part of us that likes anger and it's willing to give any kind of excuse. The same with lust, the same with all kinds of unskillful emotions. But if you keep blocking, 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 and cutting down the reasons it offers, it'll finally get to the real reasons. A lot of the reasons it first gives you are just for show, reasons that you can accept and still have a sense of your own dignity or rationality or your own intelligence. But there are some pretty stupid reasons in there as well. And those are the ones we really hide from ourselves, and yet those are the ones we most need to see. But it's only after a long series of damming the stream closer and closer and closer to the source that you finally get there. If you just let things go, you'll never know where they're coming from, what their force is, what the mind's reasons are for going with them. So this quality of restraint is very important. It's the restraint that allows discernment to do its work. Without the restraint, discernment wouldn't know what it was doing. It might deal in some very broad generalities and miss the whole point. So this practice of mindfulness, which is basically how to get the mind into concentration, is the restraint that allows us to get some control over the mind. And in the process of getting some control, we learn how to deal with whatever parts of the mind come up and object. And that's where the discernment comes in and can do its real work. At this source of all the flowing, flowing, flowing of the mind, you can finally get turned off. You see what's causing these things, the deepest root cause. And you, then you can let it go, and then you're free. You're not pushed around by these currents anymore. So even though we don't like hearing the word restraint, still it's a really important tool in the path. And the concentration allows us to do a good job of restraint. In other words, we have some control. We're not control freaks. We're control sages. We know how to control the mind, keep it in a good mood, but at the same time, keep it under close surveillance. So when something seems to be creating a leak someplace in this dam, you're right there. And someday you'll see right through it, and that's when you'll be free.